morning celebration. It's great to be with you today. We do want to welcome those that are joining us online, those that are at our campuses in the North Auditorium. And I want to say a special welcome. Our team, as Pastor Daniel just mentioned, had gone to Shy Shy, but they're actually in Pastor Mel and Diane's living room right now, listening and watching today. So come on, let's say hello to our team in Shy Shy. <laughs> I know you guys had some interesting things happen on your travel and a lot of delays, but you're there safe, and you had a great day of worship. We saw that on social media, and you got such a powerful week ahead of you. But we love you. We love you, Pastor Mel and Diane, and all that God's doing there, and we're glad that you're with us uh, for this service time today. It's, uh, it's been a great series that we've been in, this, this Daniel series. Don't forget, next week we start a brand new series called Never Settle. Pastor Joe is going to be back today. He's in Washington, D.C. He's ministering to a church there, uh, teaching leaders, teaching the church. And uh, we're getting to share our pastor with some people there in the nation's capital. And, and we all know they could use some of that, right? <laughs> and so we're glad that he's there to share with them. But he will be back next week. Uh, to bring the message and be sure and uh, come back for that and bring somebody with you. Let's pray before we dive in. God, thank you so much for this time of worship. We are especially grateful again, as we say, Father, for those uh, that sacrifice their lives so that we can just simply do this because we know there are places in the world that when people come together, they have to go in places that they have to be in secret because their lives are in danger. And we, we don't fear that today, God, because of the sacrifice of the win men and women that gave their lives. And so we are grateful for that. We're grateful for their families. And we pray your blessings and peace on them today, Lord. And now we, we just want to, to open our hearts to receive what you want to teach us today from the, from the book of Daniel as you've been teaching us these past few weeks. And help it, help it to, to rise up in us, Father, to be people like Daniel was who made a difference in, in, in the lives of the people during his time on this earth. And we pray that you will do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our series theme has been a genuine faith in a complicated world. And as we have, have heard about the things going on in Daniel's life, we, we know that, that the world was complicated, but it's complicated now. It's, we live in a very complicated time, and it's, it's, it's good to be able to compare some of the things that, that Daniel experienced uh, that, we can, that can build our lives up in the complicated world that we live in. The, the series key verse is found in Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. And we've read this each week, but let's read it again. The Bible says, many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. Those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like stars forever. Just like we sang this morning in this, in this new song, the song that our team wrote about shining, that there's, a lot, there's a lot of energy in the room when we sing that song, and it's because that's the heart of God for us to shine like the stars, to shine bright in our lives. And, that's, and, this, and Daniel tells us that. And Daniel was a light in his life. He, he, he shined bright in, in, the, in the challenges that he was in. What we don't often remember is that the book of Daniel is, really takes place over of a period of a little over 70 years. And in that 70-year period that Daniel's writing about all these awesome things he's doing for God, he was a slave. Yeah. He'd been taken captive. He'd been taken from his, his family, from his home, from the place that he had probably hoped to grow up. And he was now a captive and a slave serving the kings of this, of this nation that had captured his country. And yet he continued to have such an incredible attitude, and not just a great attitude, but he lived out these principles that, we talked, that we've been talking about. Pastor Daniel kicked it off the first week of the series when he talked about that, that Daniel was a man of vision. He could see beyond the challenges that he was facing, and he could see things that God was showing him about his future. And then Pastor Joe talked to us about how that, he, that Daniel was a man who loved God, and loved the principles of God. And he loved them so much that his life was different and people recognized it. And then, and then last week, Pastor Joe talked to us about that Daniel was a man of prayer. And, and how that will, will change our lives when we begin to be people of prayer. Uh, but 
the, the obvious evidence of the difference that Daniel made is we look at the kings that he served. He served under, under four different kings, and the Bible talks about three of these. We can see it first in Daniel chapter 2, verse 48, with King Nebuchadnezzar, the first king. And, and the Bible says, Then the king appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. He made Daniel ruler over the whole province of Babylon, as well as the chief over all his wise men. He saw these principles in Daniel, and even though he was a slave, he gave him a place of authority and respect and honor because of the way that he lived his life. And then the next king was King Belshazzar, who followed Nebuchadnezzar. And the Bible says this about this king. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was dressed in purple robes, a gold chain was hung around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Once again, a new guy comes into power, he sees Daniel's qualities of his life, and he elevates him to a, a, a level of honor and respect. And then finally, King Darius, who, who the Bible says this about him. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and the satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. We talked about this verse last week when Pastor Joe talked about this extraordinary spirit. And he asked the question, do, you, do we want to be extraordinary? Do we want to have an extraordinary life? Do we want our life to count for something? Or are we just satisfied with the status quo? And at the end of our days, when we sit down to think about what our life was like, I don't think anybody in this room is okay with saying, you know, I really didn't do that much. I went to work. I, I, raised, I raised some kids. You know, their life's okay. But I really didn't make an impact. That's, that's not the way God made us. He made, us to be he made all of us to be special and all of us to have a, a purpose and, and to make a difference and to have meaning in our life. And so if that's in our heart, well, then we may begin to say, well, then I need to start doing things differently, right? I, I, you know what? I'm going to become a person of prayer. From this day forward, I'm going to pray more, and I'm going I'm to do better at that. Or, or we might say, you know, I'm going I'm to become more committed to the church. I haven't, I've, I've been kind of sitting on the back row. No offense to you guys on the back row, but I'm sitting on the back row, and I really haven't engaged in, in the life of the church, and I, I, need to, I need to start doing that. Or, or you might say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be more generous. I want to start, start giving more. And those are all great things, but those are things that we do. And I think it's more important for us today to not talk about what we do, but who we are. When people see us, they, they, they see something different about us, and there's something that they recognize, and they say, I, I want to be like you because you're different. There's something different about your life. And I believe that as we'll see today in the book of Daniel and what I believe that we're going to learn from that, there, there was a, a wrapping around Daniel's life amongst all these things that he did. And I believe what that was was integrity. Daniel was a man of integrity. He was the same. Even though he was under difficult circumstances, he continued to be a man of integrity and followed the principles that he knew that were important in his life. So there are, there are uh, several definitions of integrity, actually, if you, if you look those up. A couple I might mention. One would, would be the quality of being honest and strong moral principles. We, we get that. We, we, we see someone who, who has these, these qualities and we say, that, that's a person of integrity. But it also has a, a, a term in construction, from my construction background, you talked about a building, uh, the, the structural integrity of a building, that when a, a storm or an earthquake or, or even time could, can damage a building that doesn't have structural integrity, when it does, it, it stands firm and it continues to last through those challenges. But I'd like to use this definition today for us as we think about integrity from, from God's word and in Daniel's life. And, and integrity would be this. 
Internal consistency or lack of corruption. Internal consistency or lack of corruption. I was thinking back in my life at a time that I didn't have internal consistency and there was a little corruption. I think some people like it when I teach because I always tell things that I did that were bad and they make you feel better. So I'm not going to disappoint you today. I'm going to tell you another story. Um, however, I was, I was 16 years old and I bought my, my first car. It was a 1965 Volkswagen Beetle. All right. It was dark green. And uh, of course, I put shag carpet in it. You know, you do the whole thing that you did back in the 60s. And uh, it was damaged. The fenders were all bent in, but it was $400. So I could afford it as a 16-year-old kid working in a grocery store. And I, I loved my little Volkswagen except for one thing. It wasn't fast. And I like to go fast. And this is the day of muscle cars, okay? Can I get an amen from my 60s brothers out there? You know, the Z28s and all that out there. And, you know, I kind of in my mind think, well, I, this is kind of a Z28. And so as we would get out and, and people were racing each other, I'd just get right in there with my little Volkswagen. And of course, you know, they could, they could race, go home and have lunch. And I hadn't even got off the, the starting line. But... I still tried to race them because I love to do that. Well, one day I got so frustrated at my little green Volkswagen. I, I, I had just, you know, been beaten horribly in a race. And I just, I just doubled up my fist and I hit the windshield. Well, the windshield in a Volkswagen was just a flat piece of glass. It wasn't curved. And I broke the windshield. And it wasn't because I was strong. It was just, it just happened to hit it in the right place. And I thought, what am I going to tell my dad? He's going to be furious. Here was my first car, and I drive home. So I, my, I have a friend with me, and we start coming up, and we go, well, let's tell him somebody pulled out in front of you, and you flew up and hit the windshield with your head. <laughs> you know, because, you, you know, seatbelts were not a big deal back then, right? And, and I didn't have my seatbelt on. And I thought, hey, that's a great idea. And then he said, but you got to have an injury so he can prove it. <laughs> So we went over to his house, and he took a stick, and he began to hit me in the head with his stick. And he had to do it several times because we had to get a lump of some sort there, right? Maybe even a little, little blood would have, would have helped out. But he beat me with his stick until I had a, 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 you know, a good red spot going, and then we jumped in the car, and I drove home. I pulled up in the driveway. I go, Dad you know, look what happened. And he goes, what? And I said, this guy pulled out in front of me. I slammed on the brakes and I hit the windshield. And he just, he just kind of looked at me and he wasn't buying it. And he went over and he, he just, he just got in the car and he sat down and he sat in the car and he started doing, he started trying to, <laughs> well, see, I hadn't gone that far. You, you, you couldn't even reach the windshield with, you know, and I thought, well, and so he just sat there, and in a minute, he, he just took his fist, and he went. And then he just like, okay, I know what happened. And I thought, he's gonna, he, now he's going to come out, and he's going to do this, you know. <laughs> he just got out, and he started laughing, just walked off. And I, I thought, are, aren't you going to do something? He goes, it's your car. You've got to pay for it. <laughs> and, I, you know, here's the deal. Not only did I experience unnecessary pain, okay, <laughs> But my lack of integrity, now my dad's not real sure he can trust me because I'm going to come up with some crazy story when the right answer would have just been the truth. Dad, I lost my temper and I hit the windshield. And he would have said, it's your car. You're going to have to pay for it. But the trust was damaged because I didn't have integrity. Daniel was a man of integrity. We can see that throughout Scripture. No matter what the circumstances were in his life, he maintained true to the principles that he had been taught as a young boy. He served faithfully and with excellence under, under the, the conditions of being a slave. And, 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 and we don't, it's hard for us to understand that, but I mean, it's, it's difficult for us to live with integrity being free. But imagine being that and, and the excuses that he could make. Well, God, you're not taking care of me, so why should I live by your principles? But he didn't do that. He continued to live with integrity. He showed the principles of God through his life to the people around him. 
and he made a difference. Here, here's the thing. The world is crying out for people like Daniel, for people of integrity. The world is looking for people of integrity to put their faith in, 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 in leadership, in business, in education, in the church. They're looking for people of integrity. We'd like, we'd like to be able to look at people that are running for political office and say, you know what, I may not agree with your position on, on the, the military or on education or on the, the federal budget, but you know what, you have integrity and at least I know where you stand. And I know whether I can vote for you or not because I know that you're going to tell the same story whether you're on Fox News or CNN or whether you're in New York or Austin, Texas. You're going to tell the same. You have integrity, and so I can, I can make a choice that I know is going to be worthy because you have integrity. We, we, we want to have employees where you can say, you know, you may not be my best employee, but you have integrity, and I can trust you. And I'm going to give you more responsibility and more authority and more money because you, you are a person of integrity. Here, here's one that hits us all. You're at the grocery store and you have 17 items in your cart. <laughs> and the shortest line is the one that says 15 items or less. And you know that when you have 15 items or less, you're counting those in front of you. And, and you got, but you don't have 15 and you say, you know what? I'm not going in that line. I'm just going to move right over here. And not only that, when I go out in the parking lot, I'm actually going to put the cart up and not just leave it out for other people to run into. That's integrity. Now, that seems simple and it seems small, but it's those small things that if we continue to do it, it just kind of nibbles away. And before you know it, you're taking a bigger step. And before you know it, you're really in trouble because you found yourself in a bad place. Let, let's look at what, what the Bible says in Proverbs about integrity. Proverbs 11.20 says, The Lord detests people with crooked hearts, but he delights in those with integrity. In Proverbs 27, the Bible says, The godly walk with integrity, and blessed are their children who follow them. You see, it's a generational blessing when we model to our children and our grandchildren the, this, the, the integrity that we have in our lives. They want to do that as well because they see the benefits that come from that. And then it's a generational blessing that passes from generation to generation. And as the Bible says, and they're blessed because of it. Proverbs 2 and 7 says that, that he, that God grants a treasure of common sense to the honest and he is a shield to those who walk with integrity. God is, God is anxious and he's looking for people in his, in his church, in his kingdom, in his creation to rise up and be people of integrity. I, I kind of like what Mark Twain said, a little more simple. But he said, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. Now, those of, those of my folks out there that are getting a little bit older, we're having a hard time remembering things anyway. But you sure don't want to have to remember, well, what did, I, what did I say to that person about that issue? And you lay in bed at night and you think, I've got to go talk to them. What did I tell them? What, what, was, the, what was the reason that I said for that issue? That, that messes with us. It, 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 it takes energy. It, it, it robs us of our joy. Jesus spoke about spiritual integrity in, in the book of Revelation when he was speaking to the church in Laodicea about the things that, that, that he saw that he said, I, I, need, I need this to change for you to be able to be my bride, to be the church that, that we're, that's going to change the world, that, that, that's the hope of the world. He said these words, he said, I know all the things you do that you are neither hot or cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you're like lukewarm water, neither hot or cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. He's saying your lack of integrity is disgusting. Get, get on one, you're, you're confusing the people of the world that are looking at the church and they're trying to say, what are these people all about? And one day you're, you're all in and one day you're not. 
And they're saying, what, you claim to be a follower of Jesus. What am I, where, where's the target? What does that look like so that I can decide whether I want to be part of that or not? And Jesus said, it, it disgusts me that you can't get in that place and stay there so people can make their decision. It, it's, it's a, let's, it, would you agree it's a missing element in our country today? It, it's, it's, it's going away. You're not, you're not hearing any, a lot about, not to be political, but politicians talking about their integrity. Because most of them don't have it. <laughs> They're just trying to get elected. Not all of them. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making a blanket statement. But I keep listening for these, for these words. Daniel's integrity was honored by, by, the, by the kings of these nations. Here's this little slave guy just doing his stuff. And they say, there's something special about that guy. There's some, and I'm, I'm going to reward him for that. I'm going to elevate him. I'm going to give him honor. I'm going to give him authority because he has integrity. So what would our lives look like if we were people of integrity today? I, I think Jesus um, talks about it in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You're the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Now probably a lot of you are going, what in the world does salt and light have to do with integrity? Well, you know, it's a simple yet profound concept because salt and light have integrity. Salt is salt, and light is light. If you see a bowl sitting on your table with white granules in it, and you go over and you taste that, and, you, and it's salt, you know it's salt. You don't taste it and go, I wonder if that's salt. You know it is. If you accidentally put sugar in a dish that was supposed to have salt, you know it. Or if you put salt in a dish that was supposed to have sugar, you know it. There's something wrong with these cookies. <laughs> They're salty because, because salt is salt, no matter what environment it's in. And when it's not salt, what does Jesus say? You just throw it on the ground and walk on it. Salt has integrity. Light has integrity. We don't look up at these lights and go, is that light? I I'm not sure if that's light or not. There is no doubt that that is light because light has integrity. So, so what, what in, in this analogy, what do salt and light do? In, in, their, in their purest form, salt preserves and adds flavor. Salt preserves things and it adds flavor. Um, it, it preserves against, against bacteria and against spoiling of something that, that we want to keep. Uh, we don't do so much of that now because we have refrigeration, but there was a day that that, that was the way that you preserved meat so it wouldn't get rotten, so the bacteria wouldn't come in. And, and salt was used as a, preser as a preservative. Um, it, it, it's, it's used to add flavor. How many times do you take a bite of something and say, I need a little salt, or it has too much salt? It adds flavor. I, I think when I was growing up, um, my grandmother, just like your grandmother, had, has the best apple pie on planet Earth, right? We, all of our grandmothers had the best apple pie. If yours didn't, I'm sorry. But, um, <laughs> but my grandfather, when he got his pie, he would always take the salt shaker and put a little bit of salt on his apple pie. And I, one day I said, I said, Granddad, why do you put salt on your apple pie? And he said, because it makes it taste better. And I thought, well, I'm going to try that. And today, if you hand me a piece of apple pie, I'm going to put a little salt on it because it makes it taste better. That's what salt does. It adds flavor and it preserves. So what does that look like for us to be salt? We are here to preserve the principles of the kingdom of God and keep it from being spoiled by the culture and by the world and by the darkness that we have all around us. 
We are here to, to, to preserve the values of God, the values of the kingdom of God, the word of God, and not let it be diluted by the opinions of men and the opinions of culture. We are here to preserve that and make sure that people understand this is what this is, what this is about. This is what God is, this is the way he wants us to live because it's, the, it's not because he, is, he, he wants to take away our fun. He wants us to have more joy and here's the principles and we are here to preserve that and, and model that in the way that we live. But he also wants us to be like salt to add flavor to people's lives. He wants us to be the kind of people that other people want to be around. There's something in your life that, that is special that makes my life better. What is it? I'm salt. Now, don't say that because then they won't be your friend anymore. But you, you want to say, that's, that's, what, that's what we do. That's what Jesus calls us to do is to be salt in the lives of others. Add flavor to their life. Then, then, then how about light? What does light do? Light overcomes the darkness and it lights the path. It overcomes darkness and it lights the path. When darkness comes in, when, when, when light comes into a dark room, darkness goes away. It, it flees. It has to. And when the light goes away, the darkness comes back. There's darkness in our world and we are the light of the world. And when we walk into a situation, we may not even recognize it, but we're bringing light into a dark place. And people... People can feel that. People can sense that. They don't know what it is, but there's something different because the Spirit of God that lives in us that causes us to be salt and light makes a difference in that. Just your presence in a room can make a difference because of, of, the, of the presence of the light that we have. And Jesus says, so go out and be salt. Go out and be light. In, in John chapter 8, Verse 12, Jesus reminds us first and foremost, he, he is the light of the world. But look what he says. Jesus spoke to the people once more and he said, I am the light of the world. And if you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. You're going to have that light, the same light that, that I am, and it's going to lead people out of the darkness. It's going to lead them out of death. It's going to lead them to life. Ephesians 5 verses 8 and 9 says, For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what's good and right and true. And, and light, light oh, it, it, it provides light for the path that we're on, the journey that we're on. If people in this world are stumbling in the darkness, they don't know where to go. They're looking, they're looking for things that they don't have in their life. And they're walking in this journey and they're tripping and they're falling down and they're going off a cliff. And all these things are happening because they're in darkness. But when we, when we get on the scene, we're people of light and we can shed light on that path and help lead them in the direction that they go. Not force them. Not cram it down their throats, but just give them the light so they can see the direction to go. Jesus said, we're a city on a hilltop. We are a city on a hilltop, literally. If you haven't noticed, you can see our building now from a long way off. And it's, right now, it's just a bunch of steel with, some, with some, a little bit of a roof on it. But what, you know what? There's going to be an 80-foot cross up there before too long. And when you drive up and down I-35, there's not going to be any doubt that there, this is a city on a hill. And it's going to be a light to this community. And so when people know that, that that's, this is our place, this is our church, this is where, where we call home, they're going to want to look at our lives. Is, is there hope for me? Is that a city on a hill that I, that I want to be part of? You see, cities, cities are a place that provide help for people's needs. When, when you're out in the, in the country at night and you're driving and it's dark, you're just about out of gas, you haven't eaten for several hours, maybe one of your kids are running fever and you need to get some medicine, or you're just tired from driving, and all of a sudden you see the lights of a city and you have hope. Yeah. We can go there and get help. 
We can get gas for our car so we can continue on in our journey. We can get food to help us be strong. We can get some rest. We can, we can get medical attention. We're a city on a hilltop that people are going to be looking as they are out in the darkness saying, where do I go to get help? There it is. Go there and you can get help. So here's what Jesus, here's what Jesus said about, about light and integrity in Luke chapter 11, verse 36. He says, if you're filled with light, which he says that we're light, if you're filled with light with no dark corners, uh-oh, you mean we can be light and have dark corners? Yeah. Because Jesus said you're light, but with no dark corners. He says then your whole life, not just part of your life, but your whole life will be radiant as though, as though through a floodlight filling you with light. What, what's a dark corner? Maybe, maybe it's your computer. There's some stuff on there you don't want anybody else to see or know that you're looking at. And so you, you keep it in the dark. And you always have this angst. What if my kids see this? What if my, what if my husband or my wife see this? It's a dark corner. What about um, you're, you're coming to the end of the month and your, your sales numbers are just that far from hitting the goal where you can get a bonus. And you say, you know what? I, I, really, I really need the money. I'm going to tithe on it. <laughs> so I'm just going to pad the numbers a little bit. But you've got the angst that if your boss finds out you did that, you're going to lose your job. You've got to keep it in the dark. Or your income tax... And maybe this year you said, well, the government's just going to waste my money anyway, so I'm just going to get creative with my accounting. But you wonder if you're going to get that call from the IRS someday that says, we need to talk. Those are dark corners. Conversations that you're having with people that you shouldn't be having. Things that, things that you're doing, here, here's, a good, here's a good measure. What are you doing that you'd be okay, that you wouldn't be okay with doing if Pastor Joe walked up to you. Oh, there's Pastor Joe. Let me get that back in the corner real quick. We all have them. We all have them. And here's the thing. You know how to get rid of a dark corner? You confess it and you bring it out in the light. And you know what? What Jesus does? He takes those things that are dark. And when we bring it out into the light and confess it, he transforms it into light. Because now, people that have that same dark corner see your life and they say, you used to do that and now this is who you are? Can you help me get rid of my dark corner? There's nothing wasted there. Jesus says, confess it, bring it out in the light, and then let me use it to transform the lives of other people. Here's, here's the deal. It's time for us to get serious. As, as, as the church, as followers of Christ, it's time to get serious. The world is getting darker, and it needs salt and light to drive back the darkness and bring joy and bring peace and bring righteousness in people's lives. The world is not going to self-correct. There is no politician that's going to take us in the right direction that, that I can, any of us can see in the foreseeable future. It's not an organization. It's not a government program. It's not education. It's the church. And Jesus said, you're salt and light. Now go be salt and light. Some people say, well, I just, I'm just praying for Jesus to come back. Well, I got to tell you, he's not coming back for a bride that's not ready. He's coming back for a bride that's radiant. 
Not a, not a bride that's, got, that's filled with dark corners. Not a bride that's, that's not washed by the water of the word. Not a, not a bride that's, that's not ready. He's going to marry this bride. There's going to be the wedding supper of the lamb at the end of time. But he, the bride's got to get ready. And the bride's not ready. It's just not. That, now, you know, bless God, he's not going to change his mind. We know that. But he's saying... I, I'm ready to come back if the bride will just get ready. You get ready and I'm there. But we go, it, it, it's about being salt and light. The, the worship teams can come at, at all of our campuses. Daniel was a man of integrity. He, he was salt and light in his generation. The, the king saw it. The, the people that, that served with him saw it. And, and he, made, he made a difference. Here's the good news today. If, 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 if this is too heavy, here, can, I, can I give you some good news? Other than the fact that Jesus is going to come back. <laughs> the good news is, Jesus would not have called us to do this if he didn't know we could do it. And Daniel is living proof that we can do this. We can do this. We can be salt and light in our generation here, here's a, the last verse in the book of Daniel. When I read this, it was just like, wow, there it is. Look, look, at, look at what it says, Daniel 12 and verse 13. God was speaking to Daniel, and he said these words. As for you, Daniel, go your way until the end. He didn't say go my way. He said go your way. In other words, God says, Daniel, you're a man of integrity. You've done well with the assignments I've given you. You're living the kind of life that's making a difference. So just keep doing it. Just, just go your way. The hope for us is then that means we can do this. If we just make the decision and make the choice and get, get the junk out of our lives that's holding us back, and, and not to be afraid of it. You know who's afraid? You know who's really afraid that you're going to get rid of those dark corners? The devil. He's the one that's afraid. Because <laughs> he's saying, if, as, as long as that's there, I've got you. But you're going you're gonna to get set free when you get those dark corners out of your life. When you start being light and salt, you're going to be slapping me around, and I'm not going to be as powerful in the earth. That's who's afraid. You don't need to be afraid. Because Jesus is saying, guess what? No corner is dark enough that I don't already know it. I know what's going on in your life, and I love you anyway. Just, just come to me. Confess it. Let's get that thing out, and let's use it against the enemy and not let him use it against you anymore. Go your way, Daniel. Good job. Keep it up. And then he says, and you will rest, and at the end of days, you will rise again to receive the inheritance set aside for you. Well done. Well done, Daniel. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's the heart of the Father. That, that's what he wants to see in us today. I'm going to pray and... and for all of us today, and then I'll hand off to the, to the campus pastors. Father, um, we just pray that the Holy Spirit would come right now, Lord, and just, just be light. Be light in our lives. Show us the things that we need to see. Expose those things in our hearts, Lord, that, that you want to show us, not, the, not out of condemnation, but out of care and out of love so that we can be salt and light just like Jesus said we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Campus pastors, if you'll come now and just lead your, your campuses uh, in a response today. God bless you. Let's spend, let's spend a minute. Let's, let's bow our heads. Um, close our eyes and let's talk about, let's talk about the dark corners. Because that's salt and light. We understand that principle. But we know that we can't be... We can't be the, the salt and light that Jesus called us to. You know, our light, Jesus says your light will be like a floodlight. And some of us, our light is like a match. 
there's light there, but it, you know what? A match will go out. And a match is not very powerful in, in great darkness. And we live in a time of great darkness. So just ask the Lord right now, Lord, what, what are those dark corners that you want to address in my life? What are some of those things? I mentioned a few, but there's a lot more. What are some of those things that you want to do something about in my life that you want, you want me to bring to the light? And this would be a great time to just confess it. Confess it to him. Just say, God, you already knew about it, but I'm going to confess to you. I'm sorry, and I don't want to do this anymore. I want you to come and help me expose these things. I, I, I want you to, to help me find an opportunity to, to, share, to share a victory over this dark corner so that I can help other people that are struggling with this same thing. Lord, I pray that every person that, that's, that's having that moment with you right now, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would come and bring peace. Bring the peace that, that's beyond our understanding. How can we have peace when we're standing before a holy God and confessing sin? But Lord, we, we, we do because you're such a good father. And then as we continue to pray, I, I just wonder if there's those here today that are saying, you know what, my life is so bad, I've got so many dark corners, I've never even bothered to ask Jesus to come into my life because I don't think he'd even, he'd even want me. I mean, just the stuff that, that I'm doing right now, why, why would God be interested in me? Can, can I tell you, if that's you today, well, here's what God's saying. He's saying, let me help you understand this. I already took care of that. I gave my son to pay the price for every sin that you have committed, are committing, or will commit. I've already taken the care of that. The price has been paid. All I need you to do is believe that and trust me and give me your heart, and I will make you salt and light. You, 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 cannot, you cannot be so dark that God does, is not standing today with open arms and saying, I, will you come to me? I'm your father. I love you. Your forgiveness is available for you. Just come ask for it. If that's you today, while well, we've got our heads bowed and our eyes closed, and you want to take that step today, and you want to say, okay, Jesus, I'm ready. I'm ready to come out of the darkness and into the light and give you my life and surrender all my dark corners to you today and ask you to be my Lord and Savior. If that's you, just lift your hand up. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Right here, over here. God bless you. God bless you in the center section. Yes, right there. Thank you. Back on the back row. God bless you. Yes, right here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. The Spirit of God is here. <laughs> yes, right over here. Thank you. Right here in the middle. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you, sweetie. Big smile. Anybody else? Yes, right over there, young man. God bless you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. God bless you. My brother, thank you. God bless you. Right back here. Thank you. Right over here. Thank you. powerful if you can't quite get your hand up don't don't feel condemnation just 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 speak it out of your heart okay and let's 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 all pray this prayer out loud those of you that just raise your hands this I'm just gonna lead you in some in some words that you can you can confess out loud and we're all gonna say it together as we all renew our commitment let's just say this dear Jesus I am so grateful for your love and mercy and for your sacrifice that paid for all my sins. 
I want my dark corners to come out into the light. I want to be salt. I want to be light. I want to make a difference.